Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. On this week's program, we focus on racial tensions in light of the death of Philando Castile this past summer and policies that may help alleviate the friction between the police and communities of color. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capital Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. Shortly after the shooting of Philando Castile in July, I had the opportunity to talk with Senator Jeff Hayden of Minneapolis about racial tensions with the police. We'd like to start this week's program with that conversation. Welcome, Senator Hayden. Thank you. Following the shooting of Philando Castile, you jointly released a statement with Senator Champion in which you said, and I quote, we know the story of his death all too well. What did you mean by that? Well, you know, most of all of my life um, and most of uh, and all of my parents' life, we have heard uh, of stories or witnessed or seen stories in which uh, African-American people um, have been brutalized by the police or uh, have been on the other end of what, uh, for real, either from their perception or for real, this issue of uh, police uh, mis mistreatment or maltreatment. And so... Um, this story, unfortunately, is not one that's new. I think we've seen it in the news lately, the advent of cell phones and, and camera phones. Uh, other people have been able to see it, but it is something that has been omnipresent uh, in the African-American community for as long as I can remember. Have you personally experienced racial profiling? Uh, yeah, I think I have. Um, there has been a lot of times when I have been you know, riding in a car um, and get pulled over by the police for no particular apparent reason, mm -hmm. uh, asked a lot of questions, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I answered the questions appropriately um, and was let go, everything uh, was okay. Mm -hmm. um, but I have to believe that that was uh, just due to, um, you know, who I was and where they thought that uh, I, I might be. Or um, after I've heard my father who uh, runs a, has a company in North Minneapolis and uh, he has had to leave his office uh, late at night uh, and has gotten pulled over maybe once or twice mm -hmm. uh, as he was making his uh, way to his suburban house uh, mm -hmm. and got pulled over and asked what was he doing in that particular area and he was working. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to cast dispersion over all police officers, mm -hmm. uh, but I think that we would be in denial if we didn't think uh, that uh, African-American people or other people of color uh, are often profiled uh, by the police. You know, you also said in that statement, quote, a lack of faith in our justice system is not only understandable, it's warranted. So what would you suggest that the legislature potentially do to address that concern? Well, I think one of the things that we really have to do is uh, get out of denial. Um, we have to really have an authentic conversation about what is happening. We have to uh, help my colleagues understand uh, what my perspective is, what a lot of people that I represent perspective is on this issue um, of justice and what does it mean. Uh, this year we did do some good work uh, on sentencing guidelines and we were able to change some of the sentencing guidelines that have put people that look like me in jail for a very long time for low level crimes. Uh, I think we have just seen here recently the city of Minneapolis is taking another look at um, if they're putting people in jail for warrants for misdemeanors and what does that do and, uh, and how does that fill up the jails and what are the cost of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that there are uh, discrepancies in terms of uh, crimes. I think that we saw that with when we had a drug epidemic in the 80s and 90s where there's a disparity depending upon um, the type of drug that you use, yes. right? And so the difference between crack cocaine, mm -hmm. right, and powder cocaine mm -hmm. and that demographically went to one group or another. Mm -hmm. If you're an African American and use crack, you got a much higher sentence and spent more time in jail than if you use powder cocaine. I look at that as an issue of addiction uh, right. and that we should be helping people through treatment. But if we do have a criminal justice solution to it, mm -hmm. uh, it should be equitable. And we found, and it's been documented, that African Americans disproportionately uh, spend more time in jail and get convicted more for the same crimes as our white counterparts. Last session, Senator Scott Dibble introduced two bills. Um, 
The first would have required increased data collection relating to use of force, profiling, and other practices. Mm -hmm. The second bill would require a special prosecutor in instances of peace officer initiated use of force. Do you think those two bills should be revived? Do you think that's good policy? Yeah, absolutely. You know, when I started the legislature in 08, we had this issue of primary seat belts, and it allowed law enforcement to stop you uh, mm -hmm. if you didn't wear your seat belt. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, it used to be that they stopped you for something else, and the seat belt was a secondary offense. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the concerns that we had, Senator Champion, was did that give people more opportunity? Uh, did it give law enforcement more opportunity to stop people of color? Mm -hmm. What we asked for in return, which we didn't get, was really good data collection to prove if this racial profiling is an outlier, a figment of our imagination, or is it true? Mm -hmm. So to collect data, I think, is really important. In almost everything we do in the legislature now, we're asking people to show us the data, mm -hmm. show us the information, so that we it helps us to make those decisions. Right, so, that so why wouldn't decisions. we do that there, right? right. Um, and so I don't know what the reluctance would be in which to do so. Um, and then in the special prosecutor, I think that we've seen that the record has shown that law enforcement officers up to this point disproportionately, if ever, get charged in these kind of fatal shootings mm -hmm. and these police brutality uh, claims um, that civilly, uh, for instance, in the city that I represent civilly, there's been over $20 million in the last 10 or 15 years mm -hmm. paid out, mm -hmm. but criminally, it doesn't align. So we think that maybe, um, and I don't want to disparage our county attorneys, they do well. Um, our grand jury uh, process is a process that works, but it's done in secret. So I think having a special prosecutor that people feel um, is independent of the politics, mm -hmm. uh, independent of some of the bias that may be inherent because people live in this community, I think that that might be helpful and to restore some of the faith that people don't have in the, in the system today. Do you think that increasing the number of minority police officers will help address some of these tensions? I think it does, but I think that it also has to be, um, I think that we, we can't legislate by simple, simple antidotes. Having more people of color involved in, uh, in policing, especially in areas that, that, represent, that they're representing a lot of people of color, mm -hmm. certainly, certainly is going to help. But I think we need to look deep inside of uh, all of us to look at our biases. It's what people are saying, implicit bias training. Mm -hmm. I'll just explain that to Minnesotans to say that we all have some sense of bias. I don't care if it's because we watched the movie or mm -hmm. because we had a bad experience or because we simply don't know them. We have some sense of what that person is before we get an opportunity to get to know them. We have to recognize that we have that. We have to right. ingrain that in the training right. process. And then when we sit down and we have to then interact with the public, we do that in a way acknowledging that maybe I think this about that person. I'm going to work on that right. and treat them equally. So. Having more police uh, officers of color is kind of one of the things in the toolbox. Right. But right. the bigger issue is that we really, really have to say that, hey, maybe I don't know these folks. And maybe my perception of them has been brought and has been given to me through outside forces that I wasn't even aware sure. of. Senator Hayden, thank you for joining me today. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. U.S. Secretary of Labor Thomas Perez joined Senator Al Franken, Lieutenant Governor Tina Smith, and a handful of female laborers at U.S. Bank Stadium recently to celebrate that the project surpassed hiring goals for women and minority-owned businesses and workers. The women took turns pointing out their HVAC, electrical, and plumbing contributions, and afterwards, Secretary Perez praised the project and encouraged further apprenticeships in trades. The real stars today are the workers that we met because when you not only meet but exceed in over 37 percent minority participation, uh, eight or nine percent I believe uh, female participation, that is consistent with the goals and values of this state, which is again everybody should have access to opportunity. Uh, apprenticeship is the other college, except without the debt. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we're seeing today and and the enthusiasm in the uh, body language and voices of all the people that we had the privilege of meeting who worked on this building is, is remarkable. And that's what I take away from this. Uh, we, in Minnesota, uh, there's just remarkable opportunity here. 3.8% statewide unemployment, 3.5% here in the Twin Cities area. Uh, and behind that figure, though, it masks um, disparities. And, and what this project is getting at is that we want to make sure that every person 
in every zip code of this community has access to those career ladders and that's what this is about because this project is is has completed but for uh, the apprentices that uh, have been part of this construction uh, their career pathway is limitless Following a summer of racially charged police shootings in Minnesota and across the United States, conversations on racial bias, profiling, and use of force in policing continue to occur. Joining me in the studio is Senator Scott Dibble of Minneapolis. Welcome, Senator. Thanks, Shannon. You sponsored two bills, at least two bills last mm -hmm. session, dealing with policing that were tabled. After the Philando Castile shooting, the Star Tribune quoted you as saying, it is clear, and it has been clear for a long, long time, that the way we conduct policing in this country needs to change dramatically. So what ideas do you have for the next session? Well, no matter what your perspective is on this whole subject, uh, it, it just cannot be denied that we have a rift uh, in our communities. Mm -hmm. uh, communities of color, in particular African American communities, really feel like uh, they're treated differently by the police. And if you doubt that, all you have to do is go to the research evidence that shows by a huge factor, uh, communities of color, African-American people feel like they're treated unfairly, uh, with skepticism. Uh, they experience rates of, of brutality and worse at much, much higher rates um, than majority culture white people do. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the best that can be said is um, there's a lack of trust uh, between the police and the communities that they serve. And so uh, the fundamental challenge we have in service to public safety and crime reduction and fighting crime um, is, to, is to repair that rift, to grow that trust, to uh, make sure that people feel like they're getting the kind of public service um, that they deserve uh, and that upholds their rights and their dignity. I lived for a long time in the heart of some of the poorest areas of Minneapolis, and I can tell you that everyone who lives there with a very, very few exceptions of the criminal element, uh, want to live in safe and secure communities mm -hmm. uh, and want to have a good relationship with the police and feel protected mm -hmm. and, and well guarded by the police. And so, um, uh, you know, I, I can't say for sure which uh, uh, package of bills, if I'll renew the existing package right. or not. I want to work with the communities that are most affected, the stakeholders, the police, mm -hmm. our, our legislative and executive branch leadership to come up with. Um, those ideas that will will make sure that we are serving the interests of public safety, building a public trust, and making sure that we're upholding um, what the police need to feel like they can do their jobs right. in the most professional manner. So in the interest of gathering more information, uh, Governor Dayton has suggested a task force. Do you think this is a, a necessary next step? I think that would be an excellent step to take and have actually already engaged with the governor okay. as well as his senior staff on that, encouraging him to to do that. I think he talked about doing that after the Philando Castile shooting. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think if we could uh, emulate and follow the model that the president uh, did, that mm -hmm. he set through the task force on 21st century policing mm -hmm. to gather a wide array of stakeholders around a table uh, to build a consensus package of policy ideas and interventions and supports mm -hmm. uh, uh, to, to maybe move on in the next uh, legislative session, that would be uh, a great way. We could uh, take that task force out uh, across the state, conduct listening sessions, right. um, engage with expert research, mm -hmm. uh, make sure that all the key players are at the table providing their perspective and their input. So to change tax just a little bit, there's increasing recognition that the police are often dealing with um, members of the community experiencing mental health crisis. Right. Do you think that the police need additional training in this area? Well, I think uh, the article that was just in the paper uh, either yesterday or, or today um, that talks about uh, de-escalation training mm -hmm. um, is, the, is the term of art mm -hmm. where um, police come across an individual who's in crisis, obviously in crisis, and there might be some opportunity to um, take advantage of time and space um, to, to ramp down uh, the intensity of the dynamic in that situation mm -hmm. um, through um, the use of professionals, uh, through uh, excellent uh, training uh, that, that the police can take advantage of uh, to maybe 
reach for some different outcomes, some better mm -hmm. communication, uh, and, and maybe not conclude some of these situations as we have seen in tragic outcomes. Right, and then to contrast that, it came out after the Philando Castile shooting that the officer involved had, in 2014, taken a Bulletproof Warrior training course. Mm -hmm. And so the criticism of these courses is that they're creating more of a militaristic dynamic right. or using more force. And then following the Ferguson incident, mm -hmm. the Justice Department said, no, the police should take more of a guardianship mentality. So should the legislature weigh in on this debate in policing practices? Right, I think, uh, I think um, in, in so many words, yes. I mean, this, this is one of the key findings of the 21st century uh, task force mm -hmm. that the President's uh, Commission turned in, and that is changing the posture, the, the, the culture, the, the mentality. Of, of a police department from that of warrior to that of guardian, mm -hmm. um, demilitarization, um, just changes a, a, a kind of a basic frame around how the police view the communities that they're serving and how they interact with those that they're serving um, and, uh, and might help uh, facilitate ideas of better communication, de-escalation, um, not making assumptions uh, mm -hmm. once they enter a, a particular circumstance and situation, um, but engage in more uh, thoughts around problem solving and, and crisis management and that sort of thing. Um, and I think that's a very, very powerful and operative frame uh, to look at. Mm -hmm. Guardianship versus warrior mm -hmm. mentality. We've seen all of the excess military equipment coming into yes. our police departments, yes. um, militarizing our police force and, and, and maybe uh, presenting uh, a hostile face uh, to a community that, that they actually should be working in partnership with. And so. Um, there are, you know, ways for absolutely for the legislature to work with um, uh, resources and the leadership of our local communities uh, to facilitate training and, mm -hmm. and to get um, some of those tools in hand. Um, very quickly, uh, police body cameras, are they a help or a hindrance? Well, uh, I think body cams have the potential to be a huge help if uh, if the policies around them and, and if their use is done correctly. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very complicated subject. It's, you really want uh, yes. to, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, the critics who say that a body cam doesn't actually capture the whole story mm -hmm. are correct, so we want to make sure that we understand mm -hmm. the data that's received through camera technology. Mm -hmm. We also want to make sure that we're protecting uh, individual uh, rights right. and right. privacy, privacy rights. Issues. That's a very complicated question mm -hmm. as well. Um, but to the extent that um, more data uh, and more awareness about the specifics around a particular circumstance can be gathered mm -hmm. in context, protecting right. all the rights, making mm -hmm. sure we're being intelligent about it, I think they can be a huge help. Senator Double, thank you for joining me today. Thank today. you, Shannon, I appreciate it. Earlier this summer, Governor Mark Dayton announced the appointment of the Honorable Ann McCaig to the Minnesota Supreme Court. Justice McCaig, a descendant of White Earth Nation, is the first American Indian appointed to the state's highest court and will replace retiring Justice Christopher Dietzen. I chose today to announce the appointment of, of Judge Ann McCaig as the next uh, Associate Justice of Minnesota Supreme Court. She uh, describes Minnesota, describes uh, you know the complexion of Minnesota and the heritage of, of uh, tribal ancestry and, and shows the importance of, of education. I hope that she serves as an example to young people all over the state of what you can accomplish. So I cannot tell you how humbled I am and how much I appreciate this opportunity. It shows the commitment from the governor to the people of all walks of life. He asked me a question during the interview and he asked me what would or does Federal Dam think about the Supreme Court? And I said they would say that it's unreachable. And so I know that's not true. I know that no one in the judiciary believes that. And I hope that today is an opportunity for the entire judiciary to send that message to all of the Federal Dams, whether it is the smallest town in Minnesota, whether it is a tribal community, or whether it is a large urban area rich in diversity, that in Minnesota, the Supreme Court and all courts are access for everyone. Under Governor Dayton, more Minnesotans can look at judges and see themselves in the faces of those judges, adding to the accessibility to the court and embracing the diversity that makes Minnesota great.
The death of Philando Castile and ensuing protests brought Minnesota's continuing struggles with racial equity front and center. Joining me in the studio to provide both a law enforcement and legislative point of view is former Douglas County Sheriff and State Senator Bill Ingebrigtsen. Welcome, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Good to be here. Following the shooting of Philando Castile, Governor Dayton said that Mr. Castile would not have been shot had he been white. You were very critical of this statement, going so far as to suggest a resolution to denounce the governor's comments if there had been a special session. Why? Well, I did. Uh, uh, as you did the introduction, uh, I was a former sheriff of Douglas County, uh, uh, totally for about 34 years, 16 as the last, my 16 in my last years as elected sheriff. Mm -hmm. Uh, I actually grew up in a law enforcement family. My, my father was a sheriff uh, when I was growing up uh, as an adolescent uh, uh, child. So law enforcement has been my family all through and through. In fact, I think you'll even hear me refer to we when I'm on the Senate floor when we're talking about law enforcement issues. So it's near, near and dear to me uh, for s several reasons. Number one is because I grew up in it. Number two is, is that I understand law enforcement. I understand the, the complications that they uh, run into occasionally. Uh, uh, having done that myself uh, on different occasions over the 34-year uh, period and knowing that those split-second decisions that they have to make, sometimes tragedy occurs like this one mm -hmm. where a young man was, unfortunately, his life was taken. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the governor, uh, the lead uh, elected official in our state to basically tell over 10,000 law enforcement officers that if there were just white people in that car, that would not have happened, was completely out of line. Uh, that comment came before, and I'm sorry to say it, before the blood was dry or the, or the, or the guns, gun smoke had even cleared the air. Mm -hmm. uh, he's assuming that that would not have happened without an investigation. And investigations are the way to determine whether people are right or wrong in this country, always have been, and he was completely out of line. I could not sit back and watch that. And especially in light of the fact that the media actually gave Governor Dayton a chance the next day to retract his statement. Mm -hmm. He would not. Uh, I, I just simply couldn't, couldn't move forward without making some comments about that because mm -hmm. public safety is so near and dear to me and should be to everybody in the state of Minnesota. Critics have raised concerns about the militariz militarization of the police force. Um, saying that certain educational programs that police go to are creating a sense of paranoia among the police force. The officer who shot Mr. Mr. Castile had recently attended a Bulletproof Warrior session um, training course. What are your thoughts on these courses? Do you think they're appropriate? Uh, I think this is the time that we're in. Uh, of course, with the deaths in, in uh, the sniping incidents in, in Dallas mm -hmm. that happened, those were with rifles. Now, there's a distinct difference between being shot at unfortunately should being shot at at all is bad mm -hmm. but being shot at with a rifle versus a handgun or a shotgun is a whole different world it's a whole different type of assault uh, the the armament that they have the body armor the the, the vests that are now uh, worn by officers simply don't work for rifles okay uh, so what's happening now is the escalation of of, uh, of officers being assaulted they have to, they have to start looking forward I mean they do and I know there's been talk about, you know, uh, a police state when you see these armored vehicles being used to, uh, to, go, up to, a, uh, to go up to a hostile situation. And, and uh, I look at it as, boy, we finally got the tools to actually address this kind of stuff. We, here I go again, mm -hmm. talking about law enforcement. We want, we want the situation, law enforcement wants the situation to be resolved as safely as they can. Not only for the person that's got the gun that's behind the barricade or behind the door, or have some, somebody hostage, but also themselves. Mm -hmm. They also want to be able to go home to their families that night. But do you think it's appropriate to refer to officers as warriors or peace officers? I, I, I don't know. I, you know, we, we refer to our heroes as warriors, mm -hmm. firemen, uh, I guess. I, I guess I, I don't know that they're, they're warriors by, by say. They, they are public servants that, that really care about their communities. Uh, whether it's appropriate or inappropriate, uh, I guess I wouldn't want to be called a warrior. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I was on the battlefield fighting for this country, I guess I would be uh, called a warrior. Um, um, law enforcement uh, being a civilian uh, type of situation is a little bit different, so the term right. warrior probably wouldn't fit quite, quite right. But mm -hmm. 
terminologies really don't mean a whole lot to me. It was reported that Mr. Castile informed the officer who stopped him that he had a permit to carry and he had a gun. With your sheriff's cap on, mm -hmm. is this the right thing for people who have a permit to carry to do, to immediately disclose that they have a weapon in their car? It if that's the case, and, 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 I, and again, I, I'm very cautious to comment on this case because I don't know any more than, frankly, what the governor knows or, right. or the public exactly. knows about mm -hmm. whether uh, he, he uh, in fact, did say that. Now, we're, we're living off of a, a, a tape that was actually uh, produced by his, uh, I think, his fiancée or girlfriend. Mm -hmm. uh, what was astounding to me was is that it didn't start until after the shooting occurred. Right. So again, I'm not, I'm not saying one way or the other whether there's anybody innocent here or whether that officer uh, responded inappropriately, inappropriately. That's for the BCA to determine, sure. as well as uh, I think uh, the county attorney from, from Ramsey County. Um, so, you, so I'm not sure about that. But just in general, do you think, I mean, if you, uh, as a law enforcement person, would you recommend that you do, absolutely. you should disclose, absolutely. yes, I have a I weapon, would, I, I have would. a permit? I would, because a lot, I think a lot of your handgun carry people, uh, number one, don't always have a handgun with them. They just mm -hmm. have the permit right. to say that they have it, and they, they can do that anytime they want to. Uh, most generally, you're going to find that gun is going to be under the seat, or you're going to find it in the glove in the glove box. Mm -hmm. And if I was approached by an officer at night or day, I would be more than open to say, "I have a gun in the glove box, where my wallet happens mm -hmm. to be. Uh, how would you like me to proceed from here? How would you like me to go after that? In fact, I would invite you, off officer, to go in there and get my license to make sure that you're safe and right. feel safe because the right. gun is there. There's nothing wrong with that at all. That would be a real positive way to, to approach it. In your opinion, are body cameras a good tool for law enforcement and for the public? Well, law enforcement, uh, it seems as though, is being very open to body cameras. They're saying, sure, why not? The problem that I have with body cameras is they're a piece of machinery that can go bad. Mm -hmm. They can be turned on and off. Uh, hypothetically, if, if something dangerous were to happen and that wasn't on, uh, for some reason it malfunctioned, automatically it seems to me the officer is going to be on trial at that point. Mm -hmm. So as far as community policing, I think it has its place. They've been around for a while, dash cameras and whatnot, um, but frankly, uh, uh, I think they're going to be a hindrance. Uh, I think the officers, uh, the problem with, with, with body cameras is they may be, may be uh, forced to uh, to, to do things that they normally wouldn't do that could turn them into a, a real dangerous situation. It's really unfortunate. But they're there and officers are, uh, chiefs of police and sheriffs are, are open to it. So far we've locally just allowed them to make their own decision. We haven't done anything statewide right. other than data. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for the opportunity. Glad to be here. Join us again next week as we continue to look at the issues facing Minnesota. On behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thank you for watching.